All right, guys, so chapter six, let's get into this because this is where we get the background information about Gatsby that helps us understand where Gatsby kind of went wrong in his quest for greatness, okay? So it starts off with this weird sort of interlude in which, um, and Nick even tells, the, tells us, our narrator Nick Carraway tells us, this will be an interlude. So we have this reporter and the reporter comes around and it's like, hey, do you have any comment? And Gatsby's like, comment on what? And the reporter's like, on just like you being you. And so for that reason, Gatsby like fires all of his people and he like kind of goes into hiding for a little bit. So it's almost as though if we're watching a movie, the action is paused. Speaking of the movie, this particular chapter is kind of put into the middle of chapter five in the movie. So this one's taken out a little bit differently, Baz Luhrmann's interpretation of it. Um, it doesn't really matter that much, only in that I think by setting this apart, Fitzgerald wants to solidify or crystallize the turning of the American dream away from greatness and toward materialism. Okay, so we have James Gatz, right? Um, and we find out that his real name is James Gatz, and then we find out about Dan Cody. So Dan Cody is supposed to be the epitome of the American dream, right? That whole idea of pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know, this is this is how we become ourselves as Americans, is that, you know, we work hard and he works hard through silver and he makes, I think Dan Cody makes the majority of his money off of copper, right? And so it's the idea that America, if America is a garden of Eden, then the wealth aspect of it is kind of a godsend, right? It is, it is part of that garden of Eden mindset, which when we think about the founding of America, you know, we had that weird Puritan time, but after that, when we were talking about how we're going to shape America, one of the big arguments of Locke is the idea that we are given this Garden of Eden and that why would we automatically assume that what we're going to do is be, you know, like the Hobbesian notion of like evil and, you know, anarchy and, you know, Leviathan, like why do we automatically assume that, you know, why not go with the Rousseau version of like, we're given Eden, we should assume that man is good too. Like if the land is good, then man is good too, right? So, you know, this idea of Dan Cody inheriting um, through his hard work, through his hard work, um, the mining and the copper and the gold and all of the riches of America, Fitzgerald is commenting on there are people who actually make this happen, right? And then about halfway through the second page of the chapter of chapter six, it's on page 98, then we get to see Gadsby's platonic conception of himself. So it's the second full paragraph on page 98. It says, I suppose he'd had the name ready for a long time even then. His parents were shiftless and unsuccessful farm people. So they were farm people, but they didn't have any ambition, right? And that's all Gatsby is. Gatsby is nothing but ambition. He is the embodiment of ambition. His imagination had never really accepted them as his parents at all. The truth was that Jay Gadsby of West Egg, Long Island, sprang from, and notice that it's capital P, Platonic, as in Plato, as in Aristotle, Platonic conception of himself. He was a son of God, a phrase which, if it means anything, means just that. He must be about his father's business, the service of a vast, vulgar, and meritorious beauty. So he invented just the sort of Jay Gadsby that a 17-year-old boy would be likely to invent, and that this conception he was faithful to until the end. Now notice that it says to the end, right? To the end means that we are going to see the end of Gatsby. So if you're looking for literary elements, that is an element of foreshadowing. So you could write that down as this is foreshadowing. Uh, and then it goes further and we see why Gadsby becomes disdainful of women, right? So the last paragraph on page 98, um, it talks about how women sort of, you know, took care of him and fawned over him and he sort of used them and he, it says, he knew women early and since they spoiled him, he became contemptuous of them, of young virgins because they were ignorant, of others because they were hysterical about things which were overwhelmingly self-absorption that he took for granted. So we find out, you know, again, if you're approaching this book from a feminist lens, it's frustrating because the characters that you've got to work with are like Daisy, right? Um, who is sort of a cynical, white on the outside, yellow on the inside, sort of, you know, 
tortured beauty who uses her wiles to get where she wants, or Myrtle, who is the hardy weed with a pretty flower that is basically just trying to use her beauty to claw her way up out of um, the Valley of Ashes, or Jordan, who seems completely and totally disconnected from everything, almost like sociopathically so, like no emotion whatsoever, you know, so it's like, it's difficult for us as women or from, from a feminist critique to read this book and see any merit in women. But now we see why, because the main person that this book is centering on, Gadsby, doesn't view women as very important. Next page 99. But his heart was a constant turbulent riot. The most grotesque and fantastic conceits haunted him in his bed at night. A universe of ineffable gaudiness. So basically, this is where Gadsby turns from, I want to be a great man. Like, I want to get away from my parents who are shiftless and lazy and don't really want to, to be ambitious, to I want to be a rich man. So he, in the paragraph from from the top of 99, shifts from greatness being, I want to be a great godlike son of God character, to my idea of godlike is the, quote, universe of ineffable godliness, okay? So this is where Fitzgerald is revealing the problem of the American dream. Um, and then further on, it says, uh, for a while, these reveries, so his dreams, these reveries provided an outlet for his imagination. They were a satisfactory hint of the unreality of reality. It promised that the rock of the world was founded securely on a fairy's wing. So this is multiple layers of philosophy. Um, it's Cartesian forms, so Descartes, remember, I think therefore I am cogito ergo sum. Um, it's a Proustian metaphor, it's the platonic conception, but it's also the existential crisis. So let's say for a moment that you are a realist, right? My husband always says that I'm a realist, I'm a realist. I think he's a pessimist, but he says he's a realist. So if you're grounded in the reality of the world and you are aware of the fact that everything around you has a cause and effect, right? Like Hume says, there's a cause and effect, right? Whether that's appropriate or not, because Hume's guillotine. But anyway, there's a cause and effect. You know, reality is the way that I understand it. The whole idea of philosophy of forms and like how forms could possibly exist. If I'm in Plato's cave, whatever, I don't care. That understanding, having that notion of I'm eventually going to die and my time on this earth probably isn't going to make that much difference anyway. That's an existential understanding of the world around you and it can create for you a feeling of despair. So Nietzsche calls this feeling of despair staring into the abyss. I stare into the abyss and the abyss stares back. The abyss staring back, not caring how you feel about it, that's T.J. Eckelberg. That's T.J. Eckelberg looking over the Valley of Ashes being like, you keep on climbing, you keep being a little cinder for the world to burn you up and be fuel and like, that's what you do. I don't care, right? I am time. I am history. I am the world. I am reality. And like, it is what it is. Good luck, right? So that can lead to a sense of despair. Now, this is where we have a misread of Nietzsche also, uh, often. Oftentimes people read Nietzsche and they're like, God, this is really depressing. Nietzsche actually doesn't argue that. Nietzsche actually argues that the fact that you don't have to rely upon a purpose given by God or fate or any of those things is pure liberty, right? And that's where absurdum comes in. So like Sartre and Camus and all of these great philosophers come in and they're like, if you don't have to have purpose, then you get to kind of do what you want, right? And that's kind of where Jordan Baker is too. But in this instance, Gadsby, who is a man of character, who has recreated himself to have purpose, like his whole goal is to not be his parents who are shiftless and purposeless. So he is supposed to have purpose. And in creating that purpose, it says these fantasies created a satisfactory hint of the unreality of reality. If reality is none of it matters, then having some notion of like, at least this little part matters. At least this little part matters, even if it's just to me, it still matters, right? And so being able to say it doesn't matter to anyone else, it doesn't matter to history, it doesn't matter to anything but me, having that optimism or that unreality, if you want to call it that, 
that is what Jay Gadsby is saying about himself in this situation, is that ultimately having purpose, and we talked a little bit about this before, right? The idea that if we take capitalism away, we've kind of removed purpose, right? We've kind of removed like, why am I even getting up in the morning, right? I don't have a job to go to. I don't lay here and like tra cram Cheetos in my face. Well, no, you can't cram Cheetos in your face and watch Netflix purposely because you need to get a job because if you don't have a job, then you can't afford Netflix or Cheetos. So welcome to capitalism, right? So if we remove capitalism completely and we don't have a green light and we don't have progress and we don't have anything to do, then that's just the reality of the world. And like, that's also kind of pessimistic and sad. So for Gadsby, it was a satisfaction of being able to create purpose, even if it wasn't a real purpose, okay? Okay, so I told you this video is gonna be long because uh, there is a lot that's crammed in here and there's a whole bunch of different philosophers. And you guys don't need to know the different philosophers. If you're an AP Lit or AP Lang, like the ones that you wanna look at are like Descartes, um, and Cartesian forms specifically. Um, I would say Nietzsche definitely. And, you know, look at Nietzsche's argument about the lion, like becoming the lion and the camel and like how to create purpose for yourself. Um, absurdism as an existential philosophy, only if you want to go down the rabbit hole. So like Sartre would be a place to go or Camus would be a place to go. Um, obviously Proust, Marcel Proust, and then the Platonic conception. So um, Plato's understanding of forms might be another place that you would go with this particular chapter. And this chapter is full of stuff. So I'm gonna stop the video there and then we'll pick back up in a minute.